Hello and welcome to the metacognition.org.uk staff CPD video on an introduction to metacognitive theory. So this is the first of eight videos on metacognition, the theory and strategies that you can implement into your teaching. So the aims of this CPD, the first one is to understand why we need to be metacognitive. Why do we need to improve our metacognitive teaching? Why is it such a big deal? Secondly, want to have a look at where metacognition fits in with the wider literature. So where does it fit in with what we already know, uh, specifically in terms of self-regulation and then on the ideas of cognition and motivation. And then lastly, it's to jump in, delve right in to the actual theory of metacognition, understand where it's developed from and try to take out some key points from it. So firstly, why is metacognition important? Why do we need to be metacognitive teachers? Firstly, might as well get it out of the way. It's an Ofsted requirement. So Ofsted require all staff to have undergone uh, professional development, continuous professional development on metacognition. So it's expected that staff have an understanding of the theory of metacognition and it's expected that staff have a range of strategies that they can implement into their teaching. However, there's a very good reason why Ofsted wants us to know about metacognition and it's for this second bullet point. Of all interventions, of all different strategies that we can use that have been identified by research and money and, and, and pilots and everything else, this is the second most beneficial thing that we can do. So the most beneficial thing is feedback, which we all do. The second most beneficial thing is metacognitive teaching. And it leads to a seven month uplift in progress, a seven month bonus in learning over a 12 month period for students. So yes, Ofsted require it, but actually, this is the reason we do it. We do it because it can lead to huge, huge jumps in progress and attainment for students. Seven months possible uplift. And it's amazing. It supports all students. So it doesn't matter who your target group is in school. It doesn't matter if you're targeting boys or girls or low prior attainers, high prior attainers, metacognition will be a strategy that supports them and supports their attainment. So you don't need to incorporate a range of different interventions. You don't need to be looking at a range of different things. Metacognition will be the solution to whatever you're trying to do to support these students. <clears throat> so the other thing is, all of these videos, all of this course is completely free. Uh, there isn't any cost involved. You don't need to go on expensive courses. You just need to sit down, take a couple of hours and listen to me drone on at you. The other thing is, it shouldn't be highly time consuming. So possibly originally it'll take a little bit more time to adapt some of your sources and your questioning to be a little bit more metacognitive. But over time, your workload shouldn't be changing. And in fact, there's actually the potential for it to begin to decrease. So it's not something that costs and it's not something that takes up any additional time. So why do we even bother with it? Why can't we just let students develop it on their own? Well, it's not something that grows on trees, as I've said here. It's not something that's going to naturally develop without our support. So you will find that some students have some strategies. Most won't, but some will have some strategies. And they've picked these up almost through luck, by chance, really, by watching what other people are doing, by watching what parents or guardians are doing, family members, maybe older brothers and sisters, just through watching, trying to guess and work out what they are doing. Now, we need to be explicit in this, and obviously we'll get onto this in a lot more detail later, but at the minute students pick this up implicitly through guessing, through trying to work it out. We're not explicit in the strategies we're using and the strategies we want students to use. So therefore, we need to start improving this in our teaching so that students' metacognitive abilities can develop. The other thing is you can never have completed metacognition. Even me delivering the CPD to you can get better at metacognition. So it doesn't matter how good a student appears to be metacognitively, there is still room for them to improve. It's pretty much infinite how much you can improve with metacognition. And so we can incorporate this for all classes, for all students, without fear that students aren't going to benefit all of them are going to benefit. 
Now, if these next two bullet points go hand in hand and they're, they're really significant to sort of reinforce my point. The first one is that it is found that if you take, say, a 12 or 13 year old um, teenager and if you compare them to an adult, earlier adult or older adult, the difference in metacognitive ability is either very slight or non-existent. So if we don't explicitly teach metacognition and its strategies, you will find by the time, the time you get a, a teenager, their metacognitive abilities will sort of peak. They're not going to get any better. And that's quite sad, actually, that you can take a year eight student and know that they're not going to get any better at something. The second thing is research has also found that those in education will continue to improve, but those outside education will either show very limited improvement or not improve at all. So in effect, we're only going to see metacognitive improvement whilst individuals are in school. We can't hope that they're going to pick it up from family. We can't hope that they're going to pick it up from work later on in life or experiences they have later on in life. In effect, they're only going to improve whilst we are teaching them and helping them to improve. And this is why it's so important. This is why we cannot wait. If we wait or if we don't do anything, students' metacognitive abilities won't improve. If we do something about it and we start to put into practice some of the strategies I will give you over the next seven, uh, seven videos, then we will start to improve metacognitive abilities and we will start to see that seven month jump in progress and attainment by students. That's why it's so important. So I'm now going to have a look at where metacognition fits in with the wider literature so we've got an idea of, of where it fits in with what we currently do. Now, firstly, it isn't self-regulation. Often self-regulation is something that it's called, but self-regulation is more. It's almost an umbrella term for a lot of personal development and social development. Self-regulation, we often see as well, a range of characteristics. So we see a self-regulated learner as one who is driven, motivated, can work on their own, always gets their work done, knows when to ask for questions, has a range of strategies to tackle problems. Now, metacognition is part of this, it is part of that self-regulation umbrella, but it's not all of it. So metacognition will cover some of those characteristics that I've just suggested, such as a range of strategies or possibly knowing when to ask for help. But it, it won't cover all of those strategies, such as goal setting. So it's part of self-regulation. It falls within that umbrella uh, sort of theory, but it isn't all of it. Now, secondly, metacognition is, is involved and linked directly to both cognition and motivation. They are prerequisites of metacognition even happening. Without cognition, you cannot have metacognition. So let me define that a little bit further. Firstly, we need to understand cognition as the skills and abilities that we have to complete a task. So, for example, the ability to drive a car, for example, the ability to chop up an onion. Those are skills, skills that we have learned and developed. Motivation is obviously the drive to complete a task, whether this is implicit, we want to do it because we enjoy it, because we want to prefer personally develop, or because we're explicitly forced to do it. If I don't, I'm going to get a detention. If I don't, I'm getting sent out. So without motivation, you're not really going to have a drive to, to, for the cognitive ability or activity. So both of those are linked as well. And you cannot have, this is a very important point, you cannot have any level of metacognition without cognition. So this will become clearer over the next few slides as we look further into the, into the metacognitive theory. But without cognition, you cannot have co metacognition. So a brief overview now of metacognition, although we're not going to get into the theory until later on in the CPD. So Flavel in 1976 gives us a very good quote that we still use to this day to define what metacognition is. It's quite a nebulous term, quite a difficult thing. And obviously, because it's met, because it's at a higher level, it's not something we can physically see. So it is quite complicated. Now, Flavel def defines this as, uh, as metacognition being uh, or noticing that you're having more trouble learning A than B. If it strikes you that you should double check C before accepting it as fact. That summarises nicely what metacognition is. A lot of people will know of it as thinking about thinking. So it's that idea, the thinking is the cognition. So the thinking about thinking is your thinking about cognition. The thinking about I'm having trouble learning this. It's not the learning, that's the cognition. It's the higher order. It's sort of that step back. 
I actually like to think of it in maybe slightly simpler terms. And I think about it as that little voice that's constantly inside your head, reviewing and supporting and asking you little questions. So let me give you an example of that. So this example is when you're driving, we all drive or we've been in a car, we know how driving works. So before you set off driving, you might think to yourself, oh, what's going to be the quickest route today? Are there any roadworks I need to be aware of? What time of day am I setting off? Will the traffic impact me? Do I need to get fuel first? Where should I get the fuel from? What's got the best prices, but which is going to be quickest? Do I need to pick up anyone on the way? Do I need to drop off somebody on the way? What do I need to be aware of in my planning? When you've set off, there are other little things that, that little voice in your head is saying. They're saying, oh, no, am I going to be on time? Because we don't outwardly say this. We just inwardly think it and process it. So you're thinking, oh, no, there's traffic. Am I going to be on time? There's a set of roadworks. I'm not going to be there on time now. Ah, the roadworks have gone. So this road isn't so bad. I didn't need to set off so early. I'll bear that in mind for the rest of the week. Those are the questions that you're asking yourself. And then that little voice, when you arrive, that little voice says, I'm not taking that road again at that time because it was mayhem. There was traffic everywhere, the car park. You might then say to yourself internally, oh, I'm not going to that petrol station again. The fuel is really expensive. That's why it was so quick because no one can afford it there. So these are the, the things that your little voice will say to you. And this is all metacognitive because none of these are cognitive actions. I'm not talking here about how to drive how to read a map, how to refuel your car. I'm talking about the little voice, the, the evaluation and the monitoring that's going on throughout this cognitive experience. So I just want to refer back now, before we delve further into the theory, on this idea that metacognition supports all students, because obviously it's a very bold statement to say that this is an intervention that will support all students. So I want to address that and explain why this is the case. So firstly, it is a myth that low prioritainers or poor problem, poor problem solvers cannot be metacognitive. It's completely wrong. It is not true. What is true is that low prioritainers and poor problem solvers will need greater levels of scaffold to make the progress. That makes perfect sense because if we have low prioritainers or students we know are going to struggle with the content of our lessons, we provide them with scaffolds, possibly we give them a times table grid, we give them a dictionary, we give them a knowledge organiser. So if we're wanting to improve their metacognition, it makes perfect sense that we would also need to provide them with scaffolds. Just because they need extra support does not mean that we don't support students in progressing and developing their metacognition. If we don't support them, they're not going to improve. So, for example, in terms of the scaffolds that I've mentioned, that might involve you providing a little bit of extra training or teaching on how to approach a problem. It might involve you providing a student with more strategies so that they can approach a problem in a range of different ways. Or it might involve you uh, providing other scaffolds that you can gradually withdraw, such as a planning um, graphic organiser or a knowledge organiser. So there are different scaffolds that we can introduce to support this and these will be highlighted throughout the next seven videos on introducing strategies. Now the reason this is really important is if we don't give students an opportunity to be metacognitive they won't improve their metacognition and so they won't be able to be metacognitive. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we don't think they're good enough and we don't give them the opportunity, they won't get the opportunity to get better, so they won't be able to do it. Yes, they will require more support, they will require some level of scaffolding, but they will be able to access it and they will be able to improve. On the reverse side or the flip side of that, high prioritainers and good problem solvers typically are better metacognitively, but again, we cannot presume that they are all superstar metacognitive practitioners. It's not true. They are likely to be better, but it is not something that's universal. Not every high power attainer is a good metacognitive practitioner. As mentioned, they may have implicitly picked up some skills or strategies just through watching and observing others, but they will still have a huge range of strategies that they can learn or that they need to learn to improve. Also, girls and boys are both going to benefit. Often we think that girls may be, oh, because they make pretty plans or they do 
good revision or they seem to revise better doesn't mean that they're going to be any better metacognitively. Both boys and girls can benefit. How much they benefit will obviously depend on the student and how well he understands strategies and go on and take them on board and utilize them, but boys and girls will both benefit. Another crucial thing is that students of all ages need to be provided with opportunities to develop their metacognition. This isn't just a case of doing it in secondary school, it's not just a case of doing it for adult learners. Research has found that kids as young as three years old start to show some level of metacognitive ability and some level of, sort of metacognitive and deeper and higher thinking. So that means that at the age or even a little bit before, we need to start providing metacognitive opportunities. So as soon as a little kid, little toddler is two, three years old, we need to start providing them with some level of metacognitive opportunity so that they can start to develop their metacognition. Of course, their metacognition needs to be uh, intertwined with everything that students do from the age of three all through early years, primary, secondary, further education, higher education and adult learning. Because as mentioned, we still as teachers need to improve our metacognition. We need to become reflective practitioners, something that I'll get onto later. So if we can improve and three year olds can improve, then everybody can improve. So this is something that it doesn't matter where you're involved with in education. This is something that needs to be implemented and utilized to support the education development of the individual. So I just want to reflect a little bit more on the difficulties that low prior attainers might have and poor problem solvers might have metacognitively. So the research is quite conclusive in the difficulties that poor problem solvers will face. Obviously, these difficulties aren't universal and some students will show some or none of these, but typically these are the things you'll find. You'll often find that these poor problem solvers read the text or the question given very quickly or they've got a very poor comprehension of what is being asked or said by the text. You'll find that this leads to students only understanding the surface level of problems, only understanding what the symbols are saying. We also find that students struggle with the difficulty of possible multiple methods. So because students have a, possibly a lower range of strategies, they don't understand that they can use multiple methods to try to tackle this problem as well. Obviously, in problem solving, the more strategies that you have, the more chance you have of being able to approach and tackle that problem. The fewer strategies, the more difficult it will be. And this is made worse by the fact that students just do what the task is telling them to do. They just follow and do what the words or the symbols say. They don't allow themselves to consider the possibility of multiple methods. Now, also, because problem solving is a non-authentic task, you find that students are uncertain about how to go about their calculations, how to go about writing up, because it's not something that they're familiar with doing. It's not something that they've seen before. So they don't have that confidence in their own abilities to go ahead and give it a go. And also because of their limited range of strategies and because of their concerns over calculations and writing up, students don't know how to verify their answer. They don't know whether they are right or wrong and they don't know how to check this. So in conclusion, these poor problem solvers have poor metacognitive abilities. And now this is either because they don't have any metacognitive strategies or they've got some that they don't use very effectively. And so this is why the benefits for metacognition or of metacognition will be greater for these low prior attainers and poor problem solvers because they're starting from a lower base. So the capacity for growth is greater. And so that's why we can see the higher levels of positive impact for these types of students. Now, if we've reflected on poor, uh, or poor problem solvers, low prior attainers, it's important to have a look at the flip side and provide a target and an understanding of where we want to get our students. And so that is with good problem solvers. So again, the research here is quite conclusive on what a good problem solver looks like. Now, the first thing is a good problem solver will understand the curriculum in the way we've designed it. They will see the links between topics. They will see how things merge together and how they support each other. So they won't see topics as individual, independent things. They will start to see how they link together and they will 
develop those rich and sophisticated and connected schemata within their brain. They will develop those links themselves. And obviously this is hugely important in problem solving, which typically uses multiple different topics and multiple different um, information areas to trying to complete the problem. These problem solvers will also typically be very good at producing a model based upon all of the information. So rather than just being at that surface level, they really dig into all that information. They produce a model based upon everything they're given and they utilize this to tackle the problem in its entirety. And they regulate their progress and they monitor their progress as well. However, it's not all plain sailing. Some good problem solvers, a lot of good problem solvers, will struggle to translate some of their abilities. So even if they're typically quite good at doing problem solving, they will still encounter issues when completing other types of problem solving. You'll also often find that high prior attainers can get quite frustrated and demotivated when they approach a problem and they don't know how to do it. This is made worse by people who are high attaining, but with poor metacognitive strategies. <clears throat> if they've got poor strategies, they're going to struggle to translate and approach different range of tasks. So where they're used to succeeding, they will then begin to not be able to succeed. So this is something that we need to be aware of. So in conclusion, good problem solvers, high prior attainers typically have better metacognitive abilities. So either they've got a greater range of strategies that they know how to use, or they've got a few strategies that they use correctly, effectively, and repeatedly frequently. So it's not just something that they occasionally use, it's something that's inbuilt into their practice. So therefore, yes, the progress level of learners such as this might be smaller, but they can still make huge amounts of progress. So we're now going to head in and look at metacognitive theory. So we've had a look at why it's important. We've had a look at the different types of learners and we know where it fits in with the wider theory. So now we're going to have a look at specifically metacognition. So it's been something that's been developed over the past 50 years, arguably a little bit more than that, but definitely over the last 50 years. And though there have been some fads and some difficulties with implementation, the implementation of the theory over the past 50 years, what it's telling us has remained pretty constant. It's not changing on a yearly basis. Metacognitive theory 50 years ago is relatively similar to what we have now. And actually a lot of the theorists that inform this theory produced their work around 30 to 50 years ago. So the main thinkers that we're going to be using on the main ones that influence the theory are Brown, who kicked most things off, Schroer, who built and adapted on this, and Flavel, who gave us a couple of alternative models which help support our understanding. Now, you might be thinking, oh, I don't need to know the theory, it's not important. Unfortunately, it is. The reason for this is the greater understanding you have the theory, the better you will understand the strategies mentioned in the next seven videos. So if you understand the theory, you will understand why the strategies will work and exactly what they're trying to facilitate for students. If we know exactly how the strategies work and exactly what their purpose is, we're going to implement them better. We're going to utilize them better. And so the outcomes are going to be better as well. So just to reassure you a little bit that at the end of this, these theories will be simplified down a little bit so that we can actually put them into practice. So they're not going to be left as this abstract theory. They will be translated into slightly more comprehensible theory that we can utilize to inform our strategies and our practice. So the first thing is that metacognition is divided into two separate parts. We have knowledge of cognition and we have got regulation of cognition. So these are our two different sections of metacognition. So the first one being knowledge of cognition, and this is the idea of what you know about cognition. So what strategies do you know? What do you know about those strategies? How confident are you using them? What strengths do you have? What weaknesses do you have? Where are your gaps in knowledge? How can this impact your strategies? So it's everything to do with what you know about your strategies, how to use them, when to use them, so on and so forth. The second is the regulation of cognition, and this is the controlling of your thinking and learning. So it's the idea of when you should use different things, how you should plan, what information you're given, how you should use that, what the task is demanding of you, how successful was your strategy use. So it's all about the evaluation and the monitoring of your thinking and your learning. So we're now going to start by having a look at the knowledge of cognition section of the theory.
And unfortunately, it doesn't end with that definition. It gets divided down into three separate parts that we need to be aware of. The first part is this idea of declarative knowledge. So this is the, the idea of what you know about yourself. It's the idea of strengths and weaknesses. So it's knowing, ah, I don't know my facts about World War II, or I don't know the stages of the formation of a waterfall, or the strategies for prime factorization are just my cup of tea. So it's, it's an evaluation of what information you know, what you don't know, and where your strengths and weaknesses lie, possibly in terms of strengths and weaknesses with different strategies as well. The second one is procedural knowledge, and this is quite straightforward. It's do you understand the procedures of each strategy? Do you know the steps involved in successfully using the strategies? And can you put those steps into the correct order? So, for example, if you're driving, do you know how to put it into gear, find the bike point, set off, release the handbrake? Can you do everything correctly and can you do it in the right order? So that's the procedural knowledge, because often we'll have students who say, oh, I know I'm supposed to use that strategy, but I can't remember the steps. That's difficulties there with their procedural knowledge. And the final type of knowledge is conditional knowledge. So this is understanding when you should use different strategies and why you should use them. So often problems allow us to tackle them with several different strategies. And so we need to be aware of what strategies are available to us. We need to be aware of which ones might work, which ones will be best and which one we should end up applying. So I've given you a couple of examples there. I might use strategy W for question four because we can provide a justification. Strategy H isn't going to work for question six because provide a justification. So this is about the when we should use it and why we should use it. Now, thankfully, in Flavel's work a little bit later on, he clarified some of these things and he's made them a little bit simpler for us. So he, Flavel has said that declarative knowledge is the knowledge of self. What do we know about ourselves? What are our strengths and what are our weaknesses? What is our prior knowledge like? Where are our knowledge gaps or where are our strengths in the knowledge? Procedural knowledge becomes the knowledge of strategies. What strategies do we know? What strategies are available to us? Which ones are we confident using? Which ones can we remember the steps of? And conditional knowledge becomes knowledge of task. What is the task asking us to do? And hence, which strategy will be appropriate to use and why? So it's these key words of knowledge of self, knowledge of strategies and knowledge of task that we're primarily going to focus upon. Now, jump over now to regulation of cognition. And this is also split down into three separate parts. These are a lot simpler, though. We've got plan, we've got monitoring and we've got evaluation. So planning is literally what you do before you complete a task. So understanding the information you've been given, deciding what needs to be done to complete the task, that sort of thing. Monitoring is understanding if you're making the correct levels of progress. Are you going to reach the end point in your task? Will you get it done before the end of the lesson? Will you get your homework done on time? Is your strategy working? Is your approach working? And then evaluation is an evaluation of this process. So um, did your strategy work? Why did it work or why didn't it work? Did you uh, change strategy or should you have changed strategy? Did you get things done on time? So it's all the idea of evaluation, considering what went well and what didn't go well. So here I've put this into a graphic organizer. So this will hopefully clarify the different parts of metacognitive theory. This will hopefully um, sort of break down that theory and put it into something that's a lot more comprehensible. So if I were you, I'd pause the video here just to run your uh, mind through the different parts of metacognition first so that we are clear on the different parts of the theory. Right then, so metacognitive processes. So we've just learned about two different sections of theory, and these got simplified down into knowledge of task, knowledge of self, knowledge of strategies, and plan, monitor, evaluate. Now, these two different parts of the theory become our metacognitive processes. So process one is knowledge of task, knowledge of self, knowledge of strategies, and process two is plan, monitor, evaluate. If there's only going to be two things that you learn from the CPD, it is these two metacognitive processes. These are the two processes that need to inform all of our teaching, our questioning, our discussion, our resources, 
These are inherently important to being a metacognitive practitioner. We need to be aware of these two processes. We need to ensure that not only are students aware of them, but they understand them and they use them. And we need to make sure that they are continually used in our practice. So these two processes are crucial. They're so crucial that the next CPD video is on these two processes alone. So why, why is this so hard? The theory is quite complex, but why is it hard to get into our teaching? So firstly, cognition is visible. So for example, if you're playing golf, someone can record your swing and then you can review that so that you can improve it again. If you're a ballet dancer in the dance studio, you've got a mirror in front of you so you can review as you go along. Motivation is pretty visible as well. You can see students doing extra work. You can see them asking for extra work. You can see them going on and taking extracurricular opportunities. However, metacognition is invisible because it's the thinking behind your cognition. It's not something that outwardly comes out. Unless a student is explicitly discussing with you, it's not something that we can judge and assess. Typically, we are quite tacit. We kind of do metacognition, but we're not fully aware of it. We're not aware of those little questions that we ask ourselves. We just do them and we're not consciously thinking about them. We need to turn this into becoming reflective practitioners. We need to be explicit about our metacognition and then we need to make this visible through our teaching. So the strategies over the next seven CPD sessions will provide you with the strategies you need, but in effect, we need to make something that is invisible, visible, so that students can learn from it and learn about it to improve their own practice. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball in here and discuss the translation of metacognitive abilities. So some metacognitive abilities can be used across subjects or across domains, such as graphic organisers. Unfortunately, most metacognitive abilities do not translate across subjects or across domains. And this makes sense. Metacognition is based upon cognition. Cognition varies by subject. It also varies by topic. So if the cognition changes, the metacognition changes as well. The demands of metacognition change and the strategies change. Therefore, if we are expecting a student who is very good at metacognitive problem solving in maths to then go and analyse and comprehend a poem, then we're going to be uh, we're going to have a shock. It doesn't always translate. Students need to develop new abilities, new metacognitive strategies for each different subject and each different domain. So it's not a case of you being able to teach it to them in one subject and ignoring it in all others. It is a case of we need to incorporate it into all subjects and all lessons that we do, because we need students to be metacognitive throughout the range of subjects that they study. Now, there is a little bit more theory behind this. It's the theory of connection. So understanding where tasks connect and how this might help us understand when metacognitive abilities may be translated and way when they might not be. So this theory of a connection is broken down into four different things. So it's it's equivalent problems which have the same structure and story. So it's basically in maths, it'd be changing the numbers in history, um, looking at causes of World War Two and maybe causes of World War uh, One. So very similar structure and similar stories. Similar problems have the same story, so the same information, same task content, but the structure of them is slightly different. And isomorphic problems are the opposite, so it's got the same structure, same way to go about it, but it's got a slightly different story, it's got a slightly different knowledge behind it. And then unrelated problems, and surprisingly, different structure and a different story. Now, the theory of connection can help us because in practice, students should be able to translate metacognitive abilities between equivalent problems because they are equivalent and they should have some ability to translate between similar and isomorphic problems because one thing stays constant. So they should be able to translate some level of ability there. But it's between the unrelated, i.e. between subjects and between domains where students cannot translate because the cognition is so completely different. So this is just something that you need to be aware of. If you teach multiple subjects to a class, then you're going to need to teach metacognit metacognition in each of these different subjects. And if you're a subject specialist, you can't rely on someone else teaching it somewhere else to these students. You need to teach it for your students so that they can improve in your domain, in your subject. 
Now, something that I've brushed upon and something that I will go over heavily in the next few CPD videos is that we need to be extremely explicit in our metacognition. How many times during the day do we plan, monitor and reflect on our practice? We're doing it all the time. We're doing it hundreds of times just in lessons alone. So what we do is the epitome of metacognition. We're doing it all the time. Yet often we're even not aware of it. Often we can become quite tacit learners. Something's going on. This plan, monitor, reflect goes on. But we're not actually that aware of it, it's just kind of going on. So the first thing is we need to be aware of our own metacognition and then we must make this explicit in our teaching. So this is going to be one of the key strategies that is mentioned throughout the rest of the CPD, as I've mentioned. Now, I just wanted to address another key misconception is that metacognition replaces your teaching. It doesn't. It is a slight intervention. It is a tweak of how you go about things. It does not replace your high quality teaching. A key point here is the more knowledge that students have, the more ability they have to be metacognitive. The more information you've got, the more content you know, the better you are with that content, the more strategies you've got, the better you are utilising those strategies, the more ability you have to be metacognitive and to evaluate different information and draw upon different strategies and consider which ones are best. So this is about tweaking your practice slightly. It's not about replacing what you do. There should be no major upheavals to what you do. Most of the fundamental mental stay in place. It is just about tweaking your practice. Now I just want to then quickly consider discrete teaching and metacognition. Now you cannot unfortunately just organize an assembly and teach students metacognition or show them this video. It won't work. We've got to consider that students learn by connecting the current learning to prior learning models, paradigms and um, experiences. If we're trying to teach them about this theory, which is quite heavy to teach to staff alone, if we're trying to teach them this, it is going to sound like rocket science. They're not going to have any clue what we're on about, and it will just be a huge waste of time. We have to teach metacognition during uh, lesson time. This is where students have prior knowledge, this is where they're developing knowledge, and they can hang these metacognitive skills off knowledge and experiences. So this is how we develop them during lessons. It's also helpful to note that we might need to help students unlearn some poor strategies. So often students, especially when they're older, when they come to revising, they learn poor ways to learn. So we're going to have to address these first before we can even begin to address the metacognitive practices for students. Remove what they shouldn't be doing and then begin to add in what they should be doing. However, as I've mentioned, there are some metacognitive abilities that do translate across subjects, and it is possible to do some level of discrete teaching for these, for example, deliverance sessions on using graphic organisers. Now, a couple of points here. The first one is, unless you are completely confident with all of the metacognitive theory, all of the ideas behind it, and all of the translational abilities of the different parts of the theory, I wouldn't recommend attempting these discrete lessons. It's unlikely to do damage, but what it is likely to do is just waste your time of the curriculum. We don't have very much time, and for you to commit a portion of it to try to teaching it discreetly could end up just being a waste of your time. You might be better just teaching it in a normal lesson and just trying to include some more metacognitive processes. The other thing is, uh, at metacognition.org.uk. We're trying to put together a range of different videos to actually provide this discrete teaching for students. So for example, with graphic organizers, there is a video on our website explaining what they are and explaining the 10 different types of graphic organizers and including tasks for students to do and the final assessment. So therefore, if you are wanting to do dis some discrete level of teaching of metacognition, I would recommend waiting until the videos are on our website and then providing these as homework tasks or home learning tasks for students to do. That way, you can just save your time from having to plan anything and you'll know that you're going to be giving students something that will be beneficial as opposed to just wasting a bit of time. So this is going to be a slide that I'd recommend you pause on in a minute. And Perkins has provided here um, an idea of the four different types of metacognitive learner and the processes that they go through. Quite often, students are tacit or below that level. We need to make students go from tacit 
all the way up to reflective. So I would pause here for you to consider where you are as an educational professional and also to consider where the students you work with are and where you would want them to be. So in conclusion, here are the highlights of the CPD. Firstly, metacognition is something that is suitable for all students. All students are going to benefit, but yes, this might it might be true that some are going to benefit more than others. The progress that students can make is huge. And also, this CPD doesn't cost and the time cost should be limited. And in fact, it should be quite beneficial in the future once you've got your head around everything. The two main things we need to take away are those ideas of metacognitive processes, knowledge of task, self and strategies, and a plan, monitor, evaluate. So these two processes need to be fundamental to our teaching. We also need to recall that metacognition is mainly subject specific and the skills are not going to translate between subjects. We know that we need to teach metacognition within our practice in all of our different subjects. We cannot rely on somebody else doing it. And remember, it is an addition to what you are doing. It is not a replacement. It is a tweaking of your practice rather than a ripping up and starting again. So we've done with the heavy theory and after this we just move on to the strategies. There are about 50 strategies split into seven different categories to put this into place and those are listed as followed. So I would recommend going through these in the order given on this video and at the end of each of the CPD videos it recommends which one you should go on to next. There is a bit of an order, a bit of a structure to them and if you go through it in this way they should hopefully make a little bit more sense. So thank you for watching. I do hope that this CPD was beneficial. I hope that you got lots of out of it and hopefully understand metacognition a little bit better than you did before. Like I say, we've got more CPD and we've also got a lot of resources at our website which will support you. We've got specific math resources, questioning resources, discussion resources. So please go and click on that teacher link and go and dig out what might be helpful for your practice. More stuff is being added all the time as well, so don't just check once and think that's it. I've only recently set up the site since schools have been partially closed, since I've had a little bit more time. So try and keep checking back to see what's being added up there as I keep trying to produce resources and CPD to put up there for you. The other thing is all of this CPD is free, but the website isn't. Now, I want to keep this resource and these CPDs as free or at free if possible. Now, I do ask if your school has got a little bit of a budget left or you as an individual have a few pennies or pounds that you could donate. I would be very grateful of this so that they can just go towards the running costs of the website. Like I say, the whole aim is to support as many students and as many teachers and schools as possible. So I don't want to have to put up a paywall. Please share it widely. I really hope that this CPD can be beneficial for a huge amount of teachers and education professionals. Please share it widely so people can benefit. Please email it on. Please pass it on to teaching and learning leads. Please pass it around your academy trusts, up to senior leadership, faculty leads. Just spread it, spread it, spread it. The more people who can watch it, hopefully the more people who will benefit from it. Do follow us on Twitter at MetacognitionU. This will give you updates on what we're doing. Um, it'll let you know when new resources and new CPD has come out. And it's also a very quick way to ask a question or to clarify anything. Right then, so I've mentioned that I will tell you at the end of each video what the next CPD is. So the next one after this is on metacognitive strategies, the first in the strategy series. And this is looking at those metacognitive uh, processes. So if you go to the teacher drop down, click on process and you'll find the CPD at the top of that page. Thank you very much for watching. And I do hope that the rest of the CPD series will hugely benefit you. Thank you.